master the business of speaking with your hosts, Taylor and Austin. You're listening to Technically Speaking. Welcome to another episode of Technically Speaking. We're your hosts, Taylor and Austin. And in today's episode, we are talking about growing your business. Just maybe not in the way that you were expecting. You see, when it comes to looking for resources to grow your business, chances are emotional intelligence isn't on the list. Instead, it's sales outreach strategies, marketing strategies, and logical processes that are supposed to produce a result. But the thing about business is it's all driven through human connection and consequently emotion. If we can master the fundamentals of emotional intelligence, we set ourselves up for a more productive and impactful business. So to help break these ideas down for us, we invited on Irvin Nugent. Now, Irvin has an esteemed background in emotional intelligence and is one of the most sought after experts on the subject. And in today's episode, we're talking about the four pillars of emotional intelligence and how remaining aware of them and working to improve them will inevitably grow your business. As always, stick around until the end for some awesome resources, and we hope you enjoy this one. See you in there. Okay, and we are live. Irvin, wow, we made welcome it. to the show, man. It's so good to have you. <laughs> Great to be here. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, oh, for sure. We've been looking okay, forward so, to this one. Yes, me too. Oh, man. This topic specifically, too, we we love it. Irvin, you're like one of the most fascinating characters on the planet, as far as I'm concerned. So many things that I'm excited to talk to you about today. Um, first of all, though, um, I see that you've got uh, your inside out characters in the background. And so like i just want to address this for the people that are on video and are seeing this going hey i know those people what's up with the inside out characters so uh there's there's many layers to this first layer is it's it's just one of the best movies i think that pixar ever made and for those who have not seen it it is much watching or must watching uh indeed whenever i begin a new coaching session i don't care what age you are or if you're the ceo of the largest company in the world i always say watch it because it really gets into uh, our emotional life. And so often I find that is an area that is not explored, and, uh, and especially in leaders. And so the characters behind me are uh, representations of different emotions. Um, and there are uh, seven universal emotions, but they chose five because it's easier to remember five. And the movie really goes into our emotional life. And, um, and I, I just think it's a, it's a one, even the, the term inside out is, is amazing because that's really what uh, our emotional life is about, is learning this mystery inside of us and exploring it. Yeah, man, that it's so cool. I love the movie. Like it teaches yeah. me something every time I watch it. I've seen yeah. it like 15 times. So yeah. it's amazing. But I'm curious, what are the two that are missing? Yeah, what I was going to say, did they, did, did they like just omit two or did they kind of blend two into like they, the they other two? They like... blend because okay. with, with, with different, uh, with, with uh, the different emotions, you know, they thought that seven was too much uh, to handle. Sure. So uh, th- there's contempt and disgust, which mm. is, uh, uh, so they blended that. And so what you got is disgust was left out and then uh, contempt was there. And then surprise, uh, surprise was left out. And gotcha. uh, surprise is the briefest emotion that we have. So it's kind of not surprising that surprise. In fact, there was an argument uh, that if surprise really was a universal emotion or even an emotion itself. So it's really interesting oh. because surprise is a transitionary emotion. You get surprised and then you move to another emotion. And so then there was debate academically, is that really an emotion or not an emotion? Or is it a transitory emotion towards something else? Huh. Wow, I've never even thought about that, but that yeah. actually makes sense. Yeah. So s- surprise, it's like a catalyst for some other emotion. Does it strengthen an emotion or something if surprise comes around or is well, it just it, a self-awareness it, thing? Like, Yeah, it, well, it's so quick. So say, for example, I'm, I'm throwing a surprise party for you. Uh, we walk into the room and everyone goes, surprise, and, and you're generally surprised. Surprise lasts half, um, maybe about a quarter of a second. And then what you'll do is you'll move uh, into another emotion. So like you're, um, the people you see bring an emotion of sadness because you're just so overwhelmed at seeing people. Or you hate parties and so you're angry. Or you love parties and you're happy. So, so it, surprise will move very quickly into something else. Wow. Huh. 
So is there like a reason why haunted houses or like like attractions that scare you lean into surprise so much because it can sort of be the catalyst for that fear emotion that they're looking for? Or like, I'm just curious if that ties into it because I love surprises and I love haunted yeah. houses and I wonder if there's a connection there. Yeah. I mean, some people, some people hate surprises, but so, and it yeah, is, my wife, you know, yeah. she's like, yeah. don't you ever surprise me. <laughs> I was like, all right, all right. <laughs> and surprise is very difficult to fake. You know, I remember when I was CEO of, of Catholic charities for a while and uh, one of the, uh, the CEO was leaving. And so they were throwing her a surprise party and I found out that uh, uh, that uh, she knew about it. And so I called her and I said, okay, we're going to this party. I know that you know, but you are going to act surprised because they put so much darn work into this. So you goes into the room and everyone goes surprised. And she goes, wow. And I said, oh, that was a fake if ever there was one, but there's no one knew it. <laughs> but, you know, real surprise is so instantaneous. It doesn't yeah. last at all. It moves in. But it's an interesting question, you know, because with our emotions as well, we're able, you know, through um, to deliberately evoke emotions within us. So, you know, people go to the movies to be afraid. They go to haunted houses to be afraid. And, and some people love evoking fear um and and being surprised yeah yeah well austin I, you're I, a weirdo i certainly do i know it's okay <laughs> yeah, i love you <laughs> so Irvin, no. one of my favorite things about uh well actually you have one of my favorite book titles on the planet uh yeah. lessons from the pub and yeah. so I just wanted to ask about that and how that translated into the whole emotional intelligence thing, especially since we just landed on this conversation from inside out. Like, how did you get to that book topic? What was that about? And yeah, lessons from the pub. Fill us in there. So I'm originally from Northern Ireland. That's where I grew up. I actually grew up in a pub. Um, I My childhood was Whoa. spent in a pub. And uh, before I came to the U.S., mainly most of my childhood and adolescence was in a pub. So not many people can wow. say that. Um, and there I left it. And uh, part of the work that I do at the moment is with executive coaching and leadership training. And, you know, it's interesting as I was reflecting uh, before the pandemic, you know, at the voices I was hearing, you know, many of it was, um, there was a lot of burnout going on, a lot of dissatisfaction, um, leaders really struggling to create what I would call workplaces that were a little more human. Hmm. And, and how do we do this? And, uh, and as the pandemic happened, I had a lot of free time, like many people. And, you know, this image of the pub came up to me that he, that this was this amazing institution that has been going on for hundreds of years. And yet there's been very little research or writing about it. And in this space, you know, I reflected about, you know, here was a space where people came in, um, they create a connection, they were vulnerable. People volunteer. They wanted to go there. And, and then for me, I said, what a great image for what leaders are trying to do, you know? And, and so that's where the title came from, Leadership Lessons from the Pub, mm. that uh, in many ways, the, and, 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 you know, some of the most emotionally intelligent people I've ever met are, are barmen and bar women. People that have, because when you serve, you know, behind a pub, boy, have you got human skills. You have to deal with, with the whole uh, length and breadth of humanity. And, and I find there's some of the most emotionally intelligent people. Yeah. Well, I can imagine. I mean, there's something about, uh, being at the pub that creates some vulnerability, right? Barriers mm -hmm. go down a little bit. Yeah. So yeah. Bartenders, I imagine get the rawest of human yeah, emotion right. a lot of the time. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's a great scene in Ireland. They said, and this actually happened. They said, you know, if the pubs ever closed, they would have to uh, triple the population of psychologists and psychiatrists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. Now, during the pandemic, it did happen. So I'm not sure yeah. <laughs> they were closed for about eight or nine well, the months. Are. Yeah. yeah. That's so funny. Well, I, I love your whole work and it's never been more important than it is now. Like we're, we're recording this beginning of January right now. And I just saw a report that came out that said November was the largest month in history where 3 million people, 1% of the entire country's workforce has quit. They've, they've left the great resignation. Like we're, we're seeing it. And in fact, I don't even know if we're really seeing the full effects of that. No, taking probably not. Place yet. Yeah. So like you just were talking a little bit about like safe cultures at work and being emotionally intelligent as a leader. Like I know we've just barely scratched the surface, but do you think that that is going to have a play in fixing this issue that large companies, well, any company is having right now with their people leaving due to this great resignation movement? Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. I was just reading a report um, the other day 
um, which is begin. And I agree with you. We're only beginning to understand this phenomenon. I, I, and but what they were uh, pointing to was that um, get, what's rising to the top is is what they call meaning and belonging. Hmm. And and I think I think we are. I think the pandemic is has begun within us something which I think is very beautiful, and that is this this discovery of of what is life about, what what is work about, what you know, kind of the wider the bigger questions. You know, why do why do I do this? What's it for? And um, and those are deeply emotional questions. Oh, yeah. They are connected to our emotional life. So I think yes, I think part of that is uh, leaders and organizations that are able to engage in those conversations and have the vision to begin to create spaces where people can connect, where people can find meaning, where people feel they belong. And I think it's part and parcel of that. So I think it's more important than ever. Yeah. What do you think has been like, why, why is there such a gap? Like, I mean, we're all all human. It's almost fascinating to me that we've created these cultures and it's more often than not where we've created these cultures where people don't feel like they have meaning or belonging. Like what went wrong? Um, I, oh, that's a deep question. I think <laughs> at many levels, um, I think the human connection went wrong. I, I, I think, you know, leader, le- people's experience varies. Yeah. And, you know, I, I hear it. I, I, and coaching conversations, it's, it's amazing what people endure at work. Um, you know, there was a frightening statistic I read a few years ago that 24% of the workforce feel lonely when they go to work. I was like, uh. wow, can you imagine waking up every day, going into work and feeling lonely and disconnected? And then what does that mean for, uh, the meaning uh, that you have in the work that you do, or even the quality of the work that you do? So I, I think it has, I think it's been going on for a long time. And, and I really do believe it's at the level of, of leadership and their ability to, to, to connect with people and their ability to um, create work that is meaningful. And I think we're going to have to rethink this, you know, the world, mm. of, we're, we're in a, in a revolutionary period, I think. And um, I don't know where it's going, but I, I, I actually, I'm quite excited about it. Yeah, I'm excited about it too. I, I really have. I feel optimistic and I feel optimistic, not because I have any expertise in this area. I have no idea what's going to happen. Thank God that you're here to help us with this. (laughs) Yeah. Like I think that people are talking and having conversations about it. And like, although there are some massive problems to solve and I don't even think, like I said a minute ago, we're even seeing the beginning of the effects of this yet. Like people are talking and there are some interesting solutions out there. There's people talking more about the work life balance and being a real human human being outside of our job four day work day week. Day. a four day work week that's a good example of that for sure yeah so i i think that there's there's a path forward and there's also just a lot of people that really want to do better like i i know all the time i'm listening to leaders and people say you know i'm i'm looking for ways to improve and like i think what i really like about your work Irvin, is that you make it tangible for people to improve yeah. in this area and i think we're kind of hoping that we can drill down into that a little bit there it, maybe in fact that's even the segue like <clears throat> i know that in emotional intelligence as a whole there's four major pillars that are sort of agreed upon by experts and actually you and i had the opportunity to sit down at a pub and talk this <laughs> over at one point and you've even like taken it and put your own little personal spin on it in a way that sort of resonates with people a little bit better just the language of these four different pillars so can they, can we maybe just like label these four things and then have you give us like a a brief explanation of these four pillars and maybe from there we can figure out some practical ways that people can improve them. Sure. Yeah. So I think, you know, traditionally there are, there are many different models of emotional intelligence. And I, I just want to say this, you know, emotional intelligence itself is a very difficult term to fully define because it is It's an umbrella term for many different things that are happening in our emotional life and our emotional relationship. But the the four main quadrants we would talk about is, is first of all, something to do with the self. And so that would be our self-awareness, the ability to be aware of what's happening within us, and then the ability to manage that uh, self-management. And then uh, in our outside world and our relationship with others. So there would be social awareness and then relationship management, uh, uh, how we ability to be aware of others and then um, manage those relationships. You know, the way I like to define it, especially in leadership, is I always like to say, you know, before you can lead others, you have to lead yourself. So then part of that is leading self. 
And then in leading self is that awareness and the management of those. And, and then secondly, leading others. And part of that is, is just the awareness of what's happening in other people and then being able to use that to manage relationships. So those are the four main quadrants. You know, people differ, disagree with what should be in each one of those. But at the end of the day, that's at the core of what we mean when we, when we talk about emotional intelligence. Yeah. Okay. So just quick recap then. So self-awareness mm -hmm. and then self-management or self-leadership, whatever term, yep. and then awareness of others yep. maybe. And then social awareness. Yep. Social awareness. Okay. And then yep. social, social leadership, interaction social management, or relationship management. Relationship yeah. management. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay. That seems practical. Um, I have a hunch <laughs> and this is just based on the interactions that I see. Self-awareness is a tough one. <laughs> tough one. Do it's you funny agree? how that's the first one in the list too. Yeah, I know. So, yeah. I'm, like, I'm sitting here like, oh, I'm self-aware. <laughs> <laughs> now what? <laughs> yeah. uh, and and of course, what's really interesting about that, Taylor, is is you said that because all of a sudden, I we 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 talked about it and like, oh, because we spend so much of our lives on self-aware and thinking of other things, and um, it's this this ability, this practice of constantly checking in and being aware. Self-awareness is the foundation of everything. Um, if, if, uh, and, and for me, I find, um, in working with any client, that's where the majority of work begins with. And, and why is it so important? It's so important because, um, for many people, they have a very limited emotional vocabulary and, um, and our emotional life is so intrinsic to our happiness. It's so intrinsic to our relationships. And if you don't have language around that and the ability to, recognize when different emotions are happening, then um, it impoverishes our life. I mean, I just have to say that. I think, I yeah. think we have a richer life when we have language around our emotions. Um, in fact, there's some amazing research coming out now with, with um, exposing um, children to, to methodologies of helping them name emotions and what emotions are happening. And, and, and it's, it's fascinating how easy it is for them to then begin to control those emotions. So th that's the building block. And then the other one, you know, would be triggers to, uh, mm. you know, so often we are triggered emotionally and that trigger sets out, um, a number of behaviors. And it is amazing how many people are unaware of the behaviors and then unaware of what triggered them. So part of this self-awareness is this, this naming of emotions, this ability to name some of the triggers that are setting us off, to recognize what they are. Uh, and all of that is, is layers. You know, that's, it, it's a work that's never done. I, I'm still discovering, you know, my own uh, emotional self-awareness. Uh, but it's well, a commitment. Sure. Yeah, it's a commitment to, to want to do that. Yeah. yeah. It's an evolutionary, evolutionary process too, you know emotions aren't just a static thing. Like we're always, our emotional state is changing and the things that trigger us change and how we respond to said triggers change. Like, absolutely. So you know, and if situations come up, we learn new things about ourselves. Like, I mean, my God, here we are in the midst of a pandemic. And mm -hmm. I think I was talking to Austin about this, you know, uh, we were on vacation before um, the pandemic started, just, just in the, in the cusp of it and, and Kauai and Hawaii, you know, in the middle of nowhere. And we had friends with us and uh, they returned uh, to uh, LA two days before we were coming back. And uh, on the last day, we get a frantic phone call said, oh my God, you got to go to Costco. You got to get toilet roll. You got to get vitamin C. We said, what? What are you talking about? And I said, I never, I, why are they acting so crazy? He said, you know, that's not us. That's not them. So I go back to Maryland and get home. And of course, uh, all of a sudden I'm immersed in this this emotional contagion that in society and Monday morning, I'm outside of Costco with a shopping trolley an hour before it opens, getting ready to fight for the last toy <laughs> goal, you know? And so, you know, I just said, I'm not like that, you know? And all of a sudden it's, so it's amazing, you know, we begin to learn, you know, kind of, Oh, it's interesting. So when I feel threatened and my survival's threatened, um, I, I'm, I'm just like the rest of them. I'm, I'm ready to go to fight for that last toilet roll. So it is, we, we're, life um, presents us challenges and we learn more and more about ourselves. Yeah. I like that you kind of talked about, you know, being able to label emotions. Cause that's probably the thing like, cause Certainly when I was growing up, they weren't teaching me words about what I was feeling and how to overcome those things. So, yeah. you know, as you as you go through life, you try and sort this out and add labels to things. And I know labels are, conf uh, you know, um, talked about regularly, but I feel like they're so important because they give you definition behind something and allows you to remember when that happens again. Like, I feel like the moment I have a label for something or, or a trigger, like I feel 
this is what happens when I feel threatened. It's more, I'm more quick to understand that the next time that it happens. And it's kind of like a, almost a superpower in a way of being able to read the label inside of the bottle you're in, you know, it's, it's really difficult to self-assess sometimes. And so having those labels really, I feel like helps me, I don't know, uh, just catch myself faster on the, on the next go of it. And, you know, it, it's a great, that's a great point, Taylor, because one of the things as well that we, we, I find is that people have very limited language. So like, how did you feel? I'm angry. Well, what do you mean by that anger? Explain yeah. it. I'm just angry, you know? And so things that, you know, what, some things I'll do is, well, if you had a, a scale of one to 10, where would that anger be? Is it a 10 anger or a three anger? And then you can start to nuance. Well, then maybe, you know, maybe you're miffed or maybe you're upset or maybe you're explosive. You know, and so the, the 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 language around that really helps us get into touch with with the intensity of emotion and and what we're feeling and and kind of knowing the knowing that emotion. What's my past history? How how do have I dealt with that? And all of that really uncovers some really interesting data that we can use um, in modulating our emotions. Wow. So I have this, uh, this model that I learned, it's actually I, I learned it because I was trying to figure out a better way to help people figure out CRMs. When I'm, I'm helping them implement that. But it's basically this, it's like a behavioral change model. And I think it kind of fits into what you're talking about right, right now. So I'd be curious just to get your take on it. Basically, you, um, you start by identifying the trigger, the thing that has made you feel whatever it is that you're feeling. And then you would define what the past behavior would be normally. So um, I got cut off in traffic. Normally, I'd honk on my horn and scream at him for the next two miles before I get <laughs> off the exit. And then you define what you would rather do instead. So I'm going to take three deep breaths and put on some classical music. And then the hard part would be executing that. But then by by doing that, by defining the trigger, defining what you would have normally done, defining what you want to do instead, and then doing that thing, if you can repeat that enough times, that's how you can change behavior. Does that align with the way that you look at this this whole self-awareness, self-management process? Perfectly. Yeah. Because part of that, you know, so so very often when it comes to emotions, the first thing, what, and I just add a little nuance to that. So the first thing is, is that very often when we have, say, what you mentioned there, a regrettable kind of a behavior. And so what, what's going on here? Very often what we're doing is we're, we're looking back. So we're looking back, what was the trigger? And then once we, once we identify the trigger, we say, is there a pattern there? Has this come up before? And if there's a pattern, then can I anticipate so say, for example, I was working with a leader um, six months ago, and there's a person that just presses their buttons. Just, uh, just whenever, I just know it, I'm going to be pressed. Well, that's something that can be anticipated. Because And Wednesday morning when I have that meeting, that person's going to be there, and I'm probably going to be triggered. So then what do I do? And then that's where, where what you're talking about then, uh, visualizing what, what other responses. So here is a response, and my response is I got angry and I snap at them, or I, I honk the horn or, or whatever. Well, what, what's other possibilities? And the great thing you know about visualization is that even if we're not doing the behavior, uh, we can create new neural pathways. It's as if we're doing it. And so providing that choice, because really that's, that's the key uh, to great emotional intelligence. It's having greater choice to react in the way that serves me and the other person the best. It's kind of like going back to that whole thing we're taught as kids, just to stop before you, you think, mm -hmm. you know, or think before you act, that whole kind of idea. Yeah. It's like yeah. being able to be in that blink of a moment before you make yeah. a decision. Yeah. And making the right one, of course, yeah. Yeah. Uh, to, to achieve that goal. That's, that's the hard part. And, and, and we so underestimate how intensely difficult that is. it sounds. That is. So yeah. It sounds easy. so easy. Yeah. So easy. And, 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 and some of us can be very skilled and I've spent a long time trying to be skilled at that, but you know <laughs> what? I wake up and I'm feeling grumpy. I haven't had sleep or whatever. <laughs> I, I, you know, it goes out the window. So, and, and I think, you know, that's one of the things I always say about, uh, emotional intelligence is, is the humility to understand that this is a learning process and some days mm. you're on and some days you're not. And that's just part of being human. Yeah. yeah, And I love that <laughs> part of being human. Let's not yeah. forget that folks. I mean, it makes sense to me too. Emotions are powerful things. Like mm -hmm. it's amazing how full lizard brain can take over sometimes. Like when, you know, some stupid thing happens and you get upset or whatever, and how all logic goes like right out the window no. and you're just yeah. like really intensely taken over by that emotion. And so absolutely pivoting you know, to... 
Yeah. The, the reason ahead. we're having this conversation today is because we are amazingly and wondrously made to survive. And that survival instinct will take over. And you know, the brain is very conservative. The brain says, survive now, act, and ask questions later. Yep. And, and so, um, you know, to interrupt that pattern is very difficult, um, but can be done, but it takes practice, you know, but, but we are, it's, it's a, it's an amazing system that we have. Mm -hmm. yeah, it is. It really feels so, like emotional intelligence is a spectrum. Sorry, Austin. I, I think I'll just polish with this thought, but I think the one thing that I'm kind of learning as I is talk to more experts like you, Urban, is that like, I felt like for so long, emotional intelligence, almost like, you know, intelligence IQ, there was just this label. You're like. 80 I, <laughs> for I give this is your emotional intelligence as well it, it doesn't ever seem fixed it seems like something that that kind of stays in flux and you can kind of be aware of this maybe even no and I don't know maybe there's a quotient but it feels like it's it's okay to be in flux with how good we're doing at this at any given time whereas it's not it's not something that's fixed or you can you can learn to improve it yeah, well, therein lies a whole discussion because, you know, very often in the early days uh, uh, when emotional intelligence was first, you know, kind of developed by uh, Dan Goleman, or at least Dan Goleman was the one that brought the science forward, you know, it was compared to IQ. And, and, sure. and really, that's not a good comparison because IQ is a very defined right. um, notion and scientific notion, which uses, a, you know, a defined methodology where emotional intelligence is like, what are we measuring? Because there's lots of different things we can measure. And, uh, you know, and the way I like to, to, the good thing about that is that, you know, your IQ is pretty much established by the time you're in your early 20s. But with emotional intelligence, it can go up and down. It fluctuates, just as you're saying, Taylor. And the other thing, uh, the other thing I would just say is that very often we have, uh, our emotional intelligence is a potential and so the more developed it is, we have the potential to act in a certain way. We have a skill set to act in a certain way. It doesn't mean we'll always do it. Mm -hmm. But it means the potential is there. And I think that's what's variable. Um, and I think what we try and grow is we try and grow our, our, our emotional intelligence potential. We try and grow our skill sets oh, nice. and different, you know, how do I read people? How do I, what am I noticing? What am I reading about myself? And then uh, we grow that potential. And then, then the second part of that is, well, when the rubber meets the road, can we really display it in, a, in an emotionally intelligent way when, the, when it arises? Uh -huh. Wow, I feel like you just gave me a whole new box of understanding for this, Urban, the potential. I relate to that because of uh, the, the, my science background a little bit. It's like kinetic energy, you know? It doesn't mean you're going to use the whole thing, but it's the potential energy of, like, your system, same kind of uh, concept it feels like. You can get to a certain level of, you know, your, your potential emotional intelligence, and whether or not we display that at any given time is kind of what's up, up in the air. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So I want to take this conversation and move it to the other side of the four pillars mm -hmm. then, which is the external mm -hmm. side of things. The relationships. So, yeah. Can, can you kind of help us understand like the distinctions here and the mm -hmm. similarities and differences between what we need to be due to doing to be yep. self-aware and managing ourselves yep. versus others? Yeah. So just as, just as the first pillar of, of the cell uh, was self-awareness. So when we move um, towards the social environment is, is how well do we notice what's happening around us? And so there's a number of things, you know, are we noticing, what are we noticing about the person's behavior? You know, we grew up in a society, unfortunately, which has a bias towards words. And so very often we're in conversation, what we're doing is we're intently listening for the words and the nuances in the words and all that is wonderful. But we miss so much about the body language that's happening in front of us. And, and, uh, and so that's vitally important. What are we, are we able to, to, to recognize um, emotions in other people, uh, shifts in what's happening in the conversation? Um, are we able to connect with people? Um, show empathy, um, you know, and, and um, engage with other people, connect with other people. And are we aware of what's happening, say, in a, in a group meeting? You know, I, I'm amazed, you know, of people who walk into a, a staff meeting and be totally unaware that the tension in the room is so thick you could cut it. Uh, <laughs> and so that, that, uh, that awareness to kind of notice you know, what's in the air. And then the, the, the final one, which I think is very important, and sometimes this is not brought up, is contextual awareness. So aware of the context of what's happening. Um, this, the, every conversation, every meeting with a person happens in a certain context. And to be aware of that, and then to also think about, well, what might I expect in that context is important as well. So that, that first mm -hmm. element is just that awareness um, and um, some people um, are more aware socially than others. And, and, and I think that's an important skill to build. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a, uh, 
I almost feel like it's easier to build skills to like be aware of others than it is to be aware of self, at least for me personally, I, I have a hard time looking inwards a lot of the time, but there's, Mm. there's so many things that you can like be looking for. And it's also interesting because like, at least when we're looking inwards, like we have a lot of that contextual information, like a lot of the things that are pulling levers, like behind the scenes we're seeing because we're experiencing and participating in the process. But it's, it sounds like at least one of the challenges with being socially aware is, is keeping in mind all of these various factors that are contributing to the emotions of other people. Like, it's not just one thing. We're not just looking to see, hey, are you happy, sad or upset or otherwise, but what in the environment is happening? What about the other people connected to this individual? How are they feeling? What are the internal things that we're not even we don't even know about that are battling in the background that they're not showing? Like, there's so much, uh, ambiguity i guess with other people because like we're not them we're not experiencing it right there's so many layers yeah yeah it it is and it's this acute awareness this ability to read a room this ability to 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 know what's happening you know you know as a speaker or whatever you know you i've been called into situations where you know um i want to be high energy and optimistic and then i walk into a room and i know that that something's just happened. I can feel it. Something, what just mm-hmm. happened? I mean, I remember a situation like 10 years ago, I was walking into a room and what I didn't realize is that um, they, they had some uh, huge organizational change, which would disrupt their lives and meant some layoffs. And so the last thing people wanted was to hear me going rah, 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 everything, you know? And so, but, but at least I had the wherewithal to kind of, oh, so something's going on here. And, 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 and so just that awareness of, of being able to read that is incredibly important. And then, you know, then following on from that, then in yeah. the engagement, in the interaction, then can you, and, and what you're really doing is these last two is, is they're, they're feeding off each other. So in conversation with another person, you're, you're noticing, you're becoming aware of, of, of the, the, the wholeness of the language that's coming to you, the body language, the voice, the intonation, everything. And you're modulating that. Um, in that conversation. And so that helps you then. How, how do you have difficult conversations? How do you have conversations that have to deal with, with um, conflict? Um, how do you build up, um, how do you build teams and, and rapport? All of that is critical to, to these essential social skills. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say the management piece of, of like the relationship management piece, you kind of needs a feedback loop, you know, because I think one thing that I've, I, I've learned is I'm going to apply this to the sales context, because this is often kind of where we are, we are, where we grew up, but like, you kind of have to meet people where they're, where they're at, you know, like, the, like you said, in your story, the last thing the audience wanted was a hoorah, optimistic, let's, you know, get this thing done type of energy. And they needed a, an energy more in line with where they're at at the moment so that they could resonate better with it. Like being able to bring your, yourself down or up to match another person's interaction to meet the, 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 the air in the room, basically. I mean, it's a dance. Oh, it's an absolute dance. And, um, um, the, the critical skill of, of, of listening and listening, not just for the words, but just, you know, listening as well with your whole body. You know, one of the, the Chinese character for listening is really incredible because it brings in, uh, it, it talks about, you know, your eyes, but also listening with your heart and your ears. Whoa, and and really? so the listen, wow. listening, you know, for me, listening is a full body, uh, experience. And so I'm listening to the words that are coming out. I'm also, my heart's engaged because that's where I'm going to engage in empathy. And then also um, I, I, I'm looking, I'm, I'm looking at, at, at this person in front of me and, and, and they're speaking with words, but they're also speaking non-verbally. And am I listening to that as well? Wow. So listening with your ears, your eyes, and your heart, that's sort yeah. of the take. Man, that is a really cool idea. I am yeah. going to take that one with me. Uh, so thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Especially, you know, especially in a, especially in a tough conversation, you know, you know, we all have conversations with people who like, eh, you know, it's kind of like uh, we've no, our empathy level is, is not the best. And, and, and so to be able to kind of realize at times, you know, that, that how can I connect in the heart here? Is there something um, that can really help me connect with this person in a way that I'm not doing? Because if I can, I'm, I'm, I'm going to listen in a different way. Uh, and I think that at times the heart can be the biggest challenge. Yeah. I read this, um, or I heard rather this old, I think it's a Chinese proverb. Someone reach out and let me know if this is right. Um, but the, it, it goes something like the, the longest journey a person will ever take is the one from their head to their heart. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I think this, uh, kind of speaks to that a little bit. Yeah. So thank you for 
being here, Urban, today. Um, I wanted Pleasure. to just take a moment, too, to talk about the context of this entire kind of session here. Like, I know we kind of were talking about emotional intelligence generally, and uh, Urban, we were talking before the show that generally we almost always have a frame around this, like how to use it in sales or marketing or building a better business. But the real reason why we wanted to come in and do this kind of show is because, like, as a business owner, for all of you listeners, like, these four pillars, self-awareness, self-management, your social mm -hmm. awareness, your social interactions, and your relationship management is crucial to the success of your business, your satisfaction with life, the relationships that you have, just, you know, because we're on stage and we're experts in our own category, it just doesn't mean that we have uh, all of these locked down at any given time. And I think keeping these front and center as we're just kind of going through the ebb and flow of running our businesses throughout, you know, the days, the weeks, the quarters and the years, um, kind of is grounding in a way, you know, it lets you be human, gives you permission to be okay with the emotions that we experience on the day to day. So Irvin, thank you from the bottom of our hearts for coming on and teaching us something new today. If someone wanted to learn more about emotional intelligence or reach out to you for some help, what's the best way for them to get in touch? Sure. You know, um, I just suggest visiting my website, uh, my name, cool. IrvinNewton.com. Got some great free resources there. I, I, I think Austin mentioned that I, I try and make this very practical and, and yeah. there are many exercises in each of those four quadrants. And, and that's the way, just get some exercises, have some fun about this and you'll find some exercises there and the information on my book and trainings as well. All right. Awesome. Well, hey, there will be a link. Definitely go check out those exercises. I've done them. They are awesome. You will certainly enjoy them if you're on a path for emotional intelligence. And uh, hey, if you like this episode, don't forget to rate it, like it, subscribe to it. And if you want more awesome resources like this, go to speakerflow.com slash resources. Thank you so much for chiming in. I just wanted to take a second to thank our sponsor, Oxbus. Oxbus is the all-in-one suite of tools you need to run your podcast. And it's actually what we run here at SpeakerFlow for Technically Speaking. It makes planning podcasts simple. It makes recording podcasts simple. It even makes publishing podcasts to the masses simple. And quite honestly, Technically Speaking wouldn't be up as soon as it is without Oxbus. Thank you so much, Oxbus. And if you are interested in checking Oxbus out, whether you're starting a podcast or you have one currently, get our special offer, oxbus.com slash speakerflow or click the link below in our show notes. Thanks for tuning in today. Check the show notes for more info and see you next time. Later.